Morning, everyone. Hope you're all keeping safe and positive. We're back with yet another talk of our Asha Ganga Jamani series called Reflections on Our Shared Past. The series has been very well received by you all, and we want to thank you, all of you who have supported us through and through. What's beautiful about this journey is that we've had some of the most renowned scholars, historians, social scientists who have come and talked to you all. The idea that this uh, platform has to be more democratic, has to open up and welcome many more people, not just students of history or historians. We wanted to move out of our comfortable echo chambers. This is the reason why we started the two series that we have Friday on Fridays and on Sundays. For today's talk, we have Dr. Ursula Weeks. She's an independent art historian. She's based in London. She was educated at Cambridge and the Courtauld Institute of Art, followed by a Commonwealth postdoctoral fellowship in Delhi, where she also taught at JNU. She currently teaches for the VNA Academy and is writing a book for Reaction Books Limited on Mughal court painting in India, which is to be out in 2022. What is she going to talk about? Dr. Weeks is going to be talking about the Mughals. We all love the Mughals, don't we? But here she's going to be talking about the interface, the coming together of the Mughals and the ascetics and how they were fascinated between like the whole idea of the synergy between earth and heaven, the temporal and the eternal, and um, how they were completely, completely enamored by the holy men and women uh, who reached beyond the mundane world of the earthly existence and gained access to higher power and wisdom. We all know the stories of Akbar and Jahangir, and we've had Professor Shirin Musvi talk to us some weeks ago about um, Jahangir and Jadru. Now here, it's, it's a very interesting world, this realm which is deeply attuned to astrology, omens, dreams, interpretation, esoteric spirituality. So the Mughal rulers really needed to cultivate relationships with key holy men to reinforce their sacred authority whether they were Hindus, Vaishnavs, uh, Shaivs, or, uh, or uh, Sufis, the, um, you know, they, were, they were very tolerant. They had tolerant attitudes towards religion from Humayun to Shah Jahan. And it resulted in the visual culture where images of ascetics, either alone in groups or in conversation with the Mughal emperors and princes, were extremely popular among the elite audiences. And they were preserved in albums. Such images did not simply reflect the pluralistic environment of the Mughal court. They were agents that helped to shape it. I can't wait to hear more about this. I really cannot because this is one of my favorite topics. And I can't wait to have Dr. Ursula Weeks, who's joining us all the way from London. Let's welcome. Good evening. Hi. Hi. It's lovely Hi. to see you. Absolutely, likewise. And um, I was I was supposed to meet you last year, but uh, we couldn't. Sorry about that. And um, oh, here we are meeting virtually. And um, hopefully we'll have a fabulous next one and a half hours with you. So, um, Dr. Weeks, I believe you've had you've lived in Delhi as well. Yeah, that's right. I lived in Delhi between sort of 2004 to 2010. And in fact, India gave us the gift of three children. So all three of our children were born during our years in Delhi. Oh, wonderful. So you had a lot of, you know, productive time in Delhi. We so, had a lot um, of time. <laughs> Yes. OK. So um, moving forward, what are we going to be talking about today? And um, how are we going to talk about this? Yeah, well, um, thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you. And, uh, you know, 
this was a bit of a last minute um, invitation for me because um, uh, I just want to send my best wishes to um, Professor Nadim Razavi um, for his uh, well-being and recovery as well. And we have been just so conscious of the, the real struggle um, between life and death for so many in India in the present days. And my thoughts and, and prayers are really, really with you um, in that way. Uh, so um, when Shagufta asked me with just a few days notice, could I speak to you today? I thought that um, best would be if I take a, a part of one of the chapters that I'm writing for my book. Uh, so Shagufta mentioned that, that it's called Mughal Court Painting in India, hopefully out sometime in 2022. And uh, today's chapter comes from, from today's paper that I'm going to speak to you about comes from the chapter on um, ascetics and angels, but I'm just giving you the ascetics. And really, when I'm writing this book, I'm thinking of my amazing students that I've taught at the Courtauld over the year, mm. or the amazing students at, at JNU, and really wanting to bring Mughal art alive to them to combine uh, the rigorous kind of historical context with visual analysis to sort of distill the best of current academic scholarship in a very approachable way and obviously to present some of my own fresh research and unique perspectives mm -hmm. on that. So uh, if you're happy, I'll launch in and just take over with my, my presentation. Absolutely, let's do that. And uh, for those of you who are watching this and uh, obviously missing Professor Razavi's presence like I am, I want to tell you and reassure you that he's on the mend, he's recovering, but it's a long journey, as you all know. We hope and cross our fingers, inshallah, he would be with us um, next weekend and, um, you know, we would uh, have him uh, close the season for us. So um, let's begin this um, talk for this evening. And um, Dr. Veek, would you like me to share the slides now? Yes, that would be great. So can everybody see the slides now? Because I can't see any of you. I can't even see No, 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 we can see screen. the slides. For sure we can. I can just see my slides. So, well, it's it's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me. And especially if you're in the UK and you had to wait an extra hour, thank you so much. Uh, sorry about that mix up on the time. But yeah, the Mughals were fascinated by this interface between heaven and earth and between the temporal and the eternal. And holy men and holy women were people who reached beyond that mundane world of existence, of earthly existent, existence and gained access to a higher power and wisdom. Now, India then in the time of the Mughals, as now, was home to many religions. You know, there were the Hindus, Muslim, Jains, Sikh, Parsi, Buddhist, Jews, Armenian Christians, and often living in intermixed communities in the larger cities. And this dazzling array of kind of mystical paths was never far from the social, spiritual, political life of the imperial Mughal court. And the generally open and tolerant attitudes towards religion from Humayun to Shah Jahan resulted in a visual culture where images of ascetics were extremely popular among elite audiences and they were preserved in al albums. These uh, images didn't just reflect that pluralistic environment of the court, they were actually agents that helped to shape it. And in some ways, art images could sometimes communicate uh, more avant-garde messages than uh, texts which were, um, you know, uh, inhibited sometimes by their literary conventions. The Mughals were keenly aware of the importance of religious and intellectual networks in promoting their rule. And although the imperial family were Sunni Muslims themselves, the diverse religious and ethnic affiliations within the empire made it necessary to appropriate ideas of jurisprudence and sacred legitimacy from multiple, multiple cultures which all converged at their court. 
Now, the German sociologist Max Weber famously defined the three main sources of authority within society as legal, traditional, and charismatic. And the Mughals were very adept at cultivating all three. They drew on a range of classical, medieval traditions, philosophical and religious, uh, and those included Orthodox Sunni and Shia Islam, mystic Sufism, uh, Hinduism, and to a greater and lesser extent, Persian Zoroastrian ideas, Turco-Mongol, Sanskrit, Arabic, Hellenistic, and Christian influences. Max Weber further suggested that religious authority could be divided into two main categories. You had kind of priestly religion and then prophet religion. So the priestly religion, if you like, is uh, the religious institutions that back up kind of authority and traditional values within a society. But then you also have these kind of prophet-like figures who are visionary individuals, often almost with a kind of maverick authority and a particular charisma. And the idea of charisma, the, the word in Persian is kul, was extremely important to the Mughals. They looked to their ancestral lineage for that concept of charisma and kul, that lineage that collect, connected them by blood to Timur and in the more distant past to Genghis Khan. But that needed to be reinforced in multiple domains and therefore royal encounters with ascetics functioned as a means to reinforce their charisma and their sacred rule. And the Mughals made paintings of uh, ascetics uh, that range from careful individual portraits taken from life to uh, congregations of holy men gathered together where maybe the focus is more on philosophical themes like the unity and diversity of religions or states of consciousness. Um, and so we're going to look at some of those images first and then in the second half we'll look more closely at images that actually depict the emperors or princes with um, particular ascetics. So, my first slide. Images of ascetics and holy men had long been valued in the Indic tradition, whether in early Jain and Buddhist painting, as well as in temple sculpture. And I'm thinking here and showing you this wonderful palm leaf um, manuscript. Its wooden cover has this double portrait of Jindata Suri and Gunasamudra Acharya, uh, two Jain monks. And this is in Ahmedabad. Likewise, Ascetics have their place in Persian painting, where they're generally depicted as stereotypes rather than as portraits. And one of the earliest links between this Persian tradition and early Mughal portraits of ascetics is a work attributed to Mir Said Ali, one of the first Mughal artists recruited by Humayun. And it shows a kneeling Sufi in his blue robe. And this work was made under Mughal patronage for Humayun, um, probably around uh, 1555. And it was then later included by Prince Salim, his grandson, in an album called the Salim Album that was made at um, Prince Salim's breakaway court, which he established in uh, Prayagraj in Allahabad. And this bearded figure has a kind of chin that juts forward and he he looks down and along in a potentially humble gaze. He wears a traditional blue Sufi robe, the kirka, the colour of mourning blue, and uh, thus it's like a symbol of the rejection of the world. But the lines of poetry that you can see above and beneath the image uh, come call into question the integrity of this holy man. They come from a servant's sermon by the uh, medieval Persian author Hakim Sanai, and it says, if it were greed that led you to acquire learning, then be afraid, for at night a thief with a torch can take away the choicest goods. And this kind of verbal visual interplay was a key feature of the Salim album where images and texts were juxtaposed to create open-ended commentaries on one another. The album includes 
a number of images of religious figures, including Hindu yogis of different sects. You can see that first and, and then the third one. Uh, a Jain mendicant, if you look at the black and white image uh, in, in Varanasi, is there a Jain uh, um, uh, ascetic, a quasi-Jesuit priest like this one with, with wings that's derived from a European print, but he's put into a kind of monk's robe. And then also the Virgin Mary that you can see there. And the poetic texts that accompany these images placed in the album at the time of its making really explore the nature of religious devotion and they suggest that the whole idea of the uni uni uh, unity and diversity of religions was an important theme uh, running throughout the album. A visual taxonomy of um, holy men is also evident in some pages of the much grander Gulshan album that was also compiled for um, Jahangir. He was, before he became emperor, he was known as Prince Selim. And this is a page from the Berlin section of the Gulshan album. And what you're seeing here is four pre-existing works that have all been placed onto the page together and then given a kind of background that interweaves them with one another. So it's like a kind of patchworked page. And in the upper left, we see a Ramnandi a sadhu with his hair half flowing down and half tied high on the crown of his head. And he has the name Rama in Devanagari um, painted on his body. The figure at the upper right is a Nat Yogi accompanied by his faithful dog. And below we have a group of sannyasis whose near naked bodies are covered with ash and who sit in various yogic poses. So the page visualizes the three major orders of ascetics in Hinduism. We have the Dasanami Sannyasi and the Nat Yogis, both of whom nowadays are very strictly Shaivite, dev devotees of Shiva, but who, um, according to James Mallinson, had much more fluid affinities in, uh, in early modern India. And then we also have the Ramnandi ascetics who are Vaishnavite, devotees of Vishnu. Images of ascetics based on observed portraiture evolved in the imperial atelier during the 16th and 17th centuries, and it was part of a broader interest in realistic portraiture. But the boundary between these uh, stereotype portraits, as we're kind of seeing on this page, and between uh, observed portraits was quite porous. And Abul Fazl, uh, the great uh, chronicler of Akbar's reign, um, makes a distinction uh, as he's writing between painting faces, which he calls chira kushai, and uh, the practice of the concept of likeness, which he encapsulates in the term manand nigari. So there's that distinction that's made between just making a naturalistic face or painting a face and actually that concept of observing somebody's individual likeness. Well, the great Akbari artist Basawan was one of the first artists to specialize in studies of holy men. And I love this portrayal of a wandering dervish, um, so carefully observed in all its details with the leopard skin thrown over his shoulder, the horn that's slung on his back, and the lovely duck head kind of finial on his long staff, the begging bowl hanging from his belt. And this uh, figure here was probably a member of the itinerant Kalandari or Kaksa Sufi sects in the 16th century. He actually bears quite a close resemblance to an ascetic in Abdus Samad's signed work of Akbar meeting a Darvish, which is in um, Harvard. But Sawan always instills a wry sense of humor in his holy men, whether they are real or imagined. And sometimes it kind of spills over into avert caricature. And the flute player on the uh, other part of this page, I think is a case in point uh, where we see this kind of spilling over into an idea of overt caricature. 
But Sawan was the likely artist of this um, portrait of a Jane Monk made uh, just at the end years of the 16th century. You can see in the top part in the sky, there's a kind of mostly erased inscription on the work. And this is probably in the hand of Jahangir, the inscription, and it names Basawan, and it cites one Chandra as the person depicted. The walking figures, uh, you know, in a white cotton lungi, and he's got this translucent shawl over his bare torso. He's got this little thin curly hair that sprouts from his scalp. And he carries a water pot and a stick, and he has a small book and a little brush tucked under his arm. And it's that brush that identifies him as a Jane. It's a, an essential attribute for sweeping away the insects before you sit down so that no living thing is, is harmed. In 1584, Akbar invited a Jane monk called Shanti Chandra to Agra. And Abul Fazl records that Akbar was very impressed by his doctrine of nonviolence. Uh, known as Ahimsa. And this painting, dating uh, on stylistic grounds to this last bit of the 16th century, is probably too late to portray Shanti Chandra himself. It may well depict a disciple of his called um, Banu Chandra, who was close to Prince Selim. But whoever the person depicted was, that inscription, I think, shows that Jahangir considered it to be a portrait of a specific historic person. Another portrait very closely observed that I love from this period is by Kesu Das and portrays an Armenian priest. Akbar had showed a genuine, apparently genuine interest in Christianity for much of his reign. And he encouraged Armenian Christians to settle in his territories from at least the 1560s, possibly valuing their trade connections across Central Asia. And this portrait's one of a number of visual and written documents uh, that confirm the prominent place of Armenians within court life. Jonathan uh, Gil Harris in his brilliant book um, on the Ferengis, I've forgotten the full title of it, but he um, cites that at least one Armenian called Abdul Hai held very high office at Akbar's court in the 1580s. The Aini Akbari names him as the Qazi of the imperial camp, in other words, Akbar's chief justice. And he had a daughter called Juliana, uh, and we learn her name from a letter of a Jesuit priest uh, called Francesco Corsi. And Abul Fazl records that she was in service in the royal harem and that Akbar then arranged her marriage to another Armenian. An inscription also plays a really crucial role, like in the, the portrait of the Jane Monk, um, in identifying the subject going on here. This is a portrait of um, Sheikh Fool at Agra by um, the artist Bishandas. Bishandas was one of the great portraitists of the Mughal Atelier in the early 17th century. And the inscription that you can see on the kind of um, plinth beneath um, Sheikh Full, is uh, written in the hand of the Emperor Jahangir. Clearly, he felt he had the prerogative to write in such an ostentatious position on, on his paintings. And he writes a painting of the Majtub, that means one attracted by God, Sheikh Fool, who lives at present in the city of Agra by Bishandas. An unpublished study drawing of Sheikh Fool uh, in Baroda, uh, which I think might be attributable also to Bishandas, is pasted onto this detached album leaf. The lower painting has um, an inscription which dates it to 1604, that painting with the, the uh, elephants there. And uh, this is in, in Baroda. And you can see that it's drawn in brush and gray ink, and it depicts Sheikh Fool in a three-quarter profile, and he's using a knife to make marks in the earth. Um, and we, I think we can be clear that this is not a copy from the finished painting by uh, Bishandas because he takes this slightly altered viewpoint. But let me go back to uh, the painting. 
we see Sheikh Fool and he's squatting, making marks in the earth and ground outside his dwelling with a knife. And this is an activity that marks time within the image and gives the work a very meditative mood. The two servants behind him add to that rhythm because their bowing postures kind of echo his. I love uh, what Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh has written about this work. He says, we watch Sheikh Fool communally or individually through the multiple eyes of the onlookers in a prolonged sequence as we follow this subliminal pictorial route. The painter invites the viewer to join the scene from several points of entrance or exit in an open street. So the crowd is almost like a circumambulation around Sheikh Fool and his dwelling here. But one figure in particular is important, seated on the right corner of the building. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but he's, he's here. And he looks directly out of the painting from its center. And although he's an anonymous servant, his outward gaze makes the viewer aware of their own act of viewing and draws us across time to become a participant in the scene. So the portrait self-consciously conveys the presence of Sheikh Fool, while also in that very moment alluding to his absence, capturing a paradox really that's latent in all portraiture. Bishandas forces us to confront this question of what is a person's essence versus what is their appearance? Because at the compositional center of this work, we have this open door. It's like an open space that leads into a more open space. So it's kind of like a void at the heart of the image. And I think in doing this, Bishan Das alludes to the goal of Fana of the Sufis. This is the idea of the annihilation of the self while remaining physically alive. And Bishan Das uh, portrays Sheikh Fool with these very earthen tones in his body. It's almost as if his body is dissolving into the um, earth there somehow. And, and to me, this compositional center at the work somehow captures the idea that his real essence is found in the kind of void of the work rather than uh, simply in his actual appearance presented here. So this portrait of uh, Sheikh Fool is conceived with a, a very wide angled lens, if you like. But uh, many portraits of aesthetics have a very intimate sense of close up. So let's just go beyond the study drawings. Some of these uh, intimate close-ups are really kind of almost ephemeral works, like this little tiny slip of paper with a beautifully observed study of a Sufi holy man here uh, wearing this heavy blue robe and woolen cloak uh, that was then pasted on to make a kind of very modest album leaf page. Others are set into uh, really um, grand albums and made as kind of set piece works for those. And one of the most beautiful that I love is this portrait of a Nat Yogi um, seated in a landscape that is um, in the Nasir al Din album in Tehran. This was an album that was begun by Jahangir and continued by Shah Jahan. And we see this intense psychological interest in the figure. Uh, the style of the landscape together with this psychological depth suggest a date in the 1620s or 30s. The yogi has these long dreadlocks um, and his long beard, his nostrils are slightly flared, his uh, ears have these heavy wooden earrings, they're split ears, and uh, he wears this big black earring and a horn pendant, his orange robe with lines of stitching, all typical features of Nat Yogis. He sits in this lush green landscape that definitely derives from uh, European landscapes. The foreshortening and the modeling of his figure combined with this sweeping landscape um, are direct responses really to the European techniques of the dramatic close-up. And they define a very intimate spatial relationship between the viewer and this yogi. 
images of saints and gods likewise like functioned as ideal representatives of the ascetic life and sometimes in fascinating ways mogul artists used formal aspects of representation to express parallels between different religious paths take for example the very striking resonances between Kesu Das's Saint Jerome and Manoha's Shiva's Gangadhara and if any of my court old, former court old students are listening they'll have known that I would put things like this as, as part of their exam, you know, to compare these two. So somebody's probably having a chuckle somewhere. On the left, we have Kesu Das's Saint Jerome as one of the earliest Mughal paintings to depict an ascetic saint of the Christian West. And it's based on an engraving of St. Jerome by an Italian Mario Cattaro. And he himself was basing his work, deriving it from Michelangelo's depiction of Noah on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. But Kesu Das emits the Christian symbolism, really, of the prince source, like Jerome's skull and crucifix and so on. And instead, he portrays a figure just deep in meditation, holding a book. At a very formal level, Kesu Das seems fascinated by the European tradition of the nude. Now, remember, he was a Brahmin uh, artist himself. He would have been more than familiar with the kind of nakedness of Hindu ascetics. But here he engages with the conceptual idea of the Renaissance nude, not only copying the naturalistic mod modeling of that classical male body, but also positioning the figure very close to the picture plane. Manoha likewise explores the emotional power of the dramatic close-up in this work on the right of Shiva as Gangadhara. So the story is here how um, the Ganges River falls to from heaven to earth through the matted hair of Shiva. And Shiva's pose here closely resembles that of St. Jerome, though Manoha deliberately renders uh, the deity's blue body without any of that modeling. This is a work suffused with stillness as the Ganges descends through his hair. And Stella Cramrich uh, comments of it, the physical prototype for Shiva's languorous attitude owed something to Italian Renaissance painting, but the vision is Manoha's own, neither Italian nor Mughal, but profoundly Indian. Its roots close to those of so-called Rajput painting. So Manoha's Indian background is unmistakable, but the borrowing from U European art, I think is much more than just the languorous pose. In fact, the most important thing is the dynamic visual experience that he creates by radically lowering the viewpoint. So, so much Akbari painting is taken from the bird's eye viewpoint. Here, Manoha brings us right down to a low viewpoint so that um, Manoha fills our field of vision with the blue deity. We're kind of on the level with his Vahana, the cow, and he draws our gaze upwards in this very vivid encounter of profound intimacy with Shiva. Well, Images of gathered ascetics sitting in a circle became a very popular trope in imperial Mughal painting from the late 16th century onwards. And many of the works in that period around 1590 to 1610 are in the Neem Kalam tech work, te technique. And that's like a so-called half pen. It's like a not very highly colored um, uh, uh, style. And this wonderful example that I just posted as a spoiler yesterday on Instagram uh, is such an incredible painting, uh, incredible painting work of art by Shankar. And it depicts this group of yogis. We've got the senior yogis in uh, the foreground with their large wooden earrings. They're seated around a fire. Four of them have yoga pata bands tied around their legs and bodies to help maintain that posture of meditation. 
The fifth one crouches near the fire, warming his hands. That, that would be me, I have to say. And behind them is this younger, uh, younger yogis, and they're discussing a Sanskrit text, which uh, Jeremiah Losty describes as a rare and beautiful mogul illustration of a poti, a loose leaf Indian manuscript on paper paper and they're extracting it from its cloth wrapper. You can see the cloth wrapper here and then the individual pages that they're discussing. And the drawing has inspection notes from the Royal Library in 1637 and again in 1677. And as well, it bears the seal that states it's of the devotee of Padshah Alamgir, Sayyid Ali al Husseini. So that name is clearly Muslim, and thus the 17th century ownership of the drawing points to ongoing tolerance between Hindus and Muslims among elites during Aurangzeb's reign. When it comes to portraits of holy men, the really standout artist is Govardhan. Under Jahangir's patronage, he became a leading specialist in painting images of holy men, especially in groups together. Often they might be in the company of musicians or soldiers and princes in a kind of blend of the contemplative and active life. Govardhan was a Hindu Khanazad, that meant he was born at the palace. He's the son of the artist Bhavani Das. And so he was really well versed in the conventions of Akbari painting. But around the time he joined that rebel breakaway court of Prince Salim at Prayagraj, he began to break really new ground in his art, leaving behind the more traditional kind of history painting of Akbar's reign to make very closely observed genre portraits of ascetics. And he also became a brilliant observer and portrayer of mood among women at the court too. As one of the holiest cities in Hinduism, Prayagraj must have been an inspiration to Govardhan with all the Hindu yogis coming from all over India drawn to the riverbanks where the Yamuna and the uh, Ganga converge together. So, uh, Five Holy Men Around a Fire is a very famous work uh, attributed to Govardhan, one of his real masterpieces. And we see five ascetics of different ages, from young to old, sitting in a circle near a smouldering fire. Here's the smouldering fire. They're set in a landscape with a distant vista to a city on the left and a temple uh, that's on that hill on the right. And it seems to be, it's been suggested, this is the iconic Hindu temple of Shankacharya near Srinagar in Kashmir. Each figure is in a different posture and state of meditation. You've got the uh, three upright figures, very naturalistic portraits, pro probably of known ascetics. Uh, and then Govan Bailey has identified this figure here as possibly deriving from this print um, of St. John Chrysostom by Bartle Bayham, where he's kind of taken this naked figure of a woman and just transposed it into being the naked figure of a male, young male ascetic. Um, the two young ascetics, so this one here and this one here, they both refuse our gaze. This one by placing his arm over his eyes and here obviously by turning his back to us. And in contrast, this sannyasi here, he gazes directly out of the painting. And given that the moguls seldom made a feature of the outward gaze in their art, this commanding look of the, from this ascetic, I think, is one of the most confrontational stares in all of Mughal art. Govardhan moves from figure to figure in this circle, exploring their dis different states of consciousness. They don't look at one another, and yet their uh, subjective religious experience and their trance states are not purely individualistic because they occur within this social gathering. And the Hindu and Jain Bhakti movements, the devotional movements of the 16th, 17th century emphasized experiential piety over 
doctrinal beliefs. And really images like this reinforce that idea of a kind of circle of faith. The multiplicity of devotional forms from yoga, spiritual ecstasy, meditation, re reciting the names of Allah and so on, as well as all the eclectic customs of dress and insignia were considered by many as the diverse manifestations arising from one essential unity in God. Paintings that portray ascetics making or under the influence of drugs also um, fit into this whole uh, concept of transcendental experience and heightened religious ecstasy. Here they're making bang, which is that potent form of marijuana. And James Mallinson's written really interestingly on the connection between drugs and religion in India in uh, a Francesca Galloway catalogue in 2018. For the Mughals, the Neoplatonic uh, concept of the unity of all being known as Wadat al-Wujud was really foundational. These ideas had gained enormous influence in the Islamic world through the writings of Ibn al-Arabi, the 12th century thinker, and they underpinned Mughal beliefs about transcendental knowledge. Now, in the 20th century, the idea of multiplicity has come to refer through the philosophical works of Foucault or Deleuze as a diversity that does not arise from a prior unity. But the Mughals were not postmoderns. They were essentially theistic structuralists and their epistemology held that the phenomena of human life are made intelligible through their interrelationships and that those interconnections constitute underlying abstract structures ordered by God. One of the prime intellectuals in early Mughal India who wrote on the kind of confluence of mystic Islam and Hindu ascetic practices was a Sufi of the Shatari order based at Gwalior called Muhammad Goth. And this is his tomb in Gwalior with incredible Jali, the lattice um, windows. And uh, Goth's Bar al Hayat was composed around 1550 in Persian, uh, and it's the first text to offer detailed written description of the yoga asanas, body poses. And Hindu gurus would teach these poses directly, but Goth actually wrote them down, wishing to demonstrate the kind of compatibility of Sufi goals of spiritual formation with uh, Hindu yogic practices. Goth was widely revered and his influence at the Mughal court was significant, not least because he was the teacher of Akbar's famed musician, uh, Tansin. Akbar was familiar with this text, the Bar al Hayat, but it was his son, Prince Salim, who commissioned an illustrated manuscript of the text while he was at Prayagraj at Allahabad with 64 folios and 21 miniatures showing uh, these yoga poses. And these are the first uh, lexical illustrations of yoga asanas made in India. And I think that captures the pluralism of India's history that they should have been made at the behest of a Muslim patron. By the mid 17th century, the heir apparent, Prince Darashika, was in the vanguard of expressions of syncretic faith. In 15, 1654, Darashika wrote a treatise called Majma al Bahrain, the mingling of two oceans, in which he sought to reveal the transcendental monistic unity of Islam, Hinduism, and other religions. And in the first chapter on the vision of God, he wrote, the perfect divines and the seers of all religions, whether they're believers in the Quran, the Vedas, the Book of David, or the Old and New Testaments, have a common faith. And in 1657, with the help of Brahmin scholars, Darashika translated 52 of the Upanishads, ancient Hindu texts of the Vedas, from Sanskrit to Persian. And in his introduction, Darachika conjectured that the Kitab al-Manun, the hidden book mentioned in the Quran, was none other than the Upanishads. It was uh, likely that 
Under uh, Darashika's patronage, this painting on the right was made, dating from about 1650 to 1655. And here we see a gathering of Sufis and Hindu holy men at the Shishti uh, shrine in Ajmer. Several Hindu, uh, several Sufis are in a state of trance, urged on by these musicians here. And presiding over the scene at the back here is the historical figure of Muinuddin Shishta, the Shishti, the founder of the Sufi sect at Ajmer. But the gathering also uh, includes a contemporary holy man, uh, Mullah Shah, also at the back, whom Dara Shikha followed. And along the front of the image, we see a series of Hindu religious figures, each identified by a tiny uh, little inscription showing that they are Hindu thinkers dating from the fifth century right through to the 17th century. And this figure just third from the right is Gosain Yadrup, who you had the session on a few weeks ago and whom Jahangir met on several occasions. So the painting visualizes a concept of universal faith and really reinforces the message of sul ikul, peace to all, and the unity of all being. Well, thus far we've discussed images of ascetics alone or in groups together. And these works functioned as encounters between the Mughal elite and the ascetics that are depicted because they were commissioned by the Mughal elite and they were preserved in royal albums that circulated at the imperial court. So as people were looking at the albums, the process of actually engaging uh, with the artworks was a means of encounter with those ascetics. But artworks, many artworks also actually depict meetings between royal and religious figures. And this was a, a very favored subject that has a significant place in Mughal art. It's something that has a trajectory back to Timurid and Safavid art as well, because it was a popular theme um, in, in those cultural contexts also. In a culture that was deeply attuned to astrology, to omens, to dreams, to esoteric spirituality, Mughal rulers needed to cultivate relationships with holy men to reinforce their sacred authority. Babur, the first Mughal emperor, had a deep attachment to the Naqshbandi Sufis of Central Asia, and the Timurid royal family had a really long association with the Naqshbandi. And Babur stresses the importance of the relationship that existed between his own father and Khwaja Ubaidullah Ara. And he was a Naqshbandi Sufi who was one of the biggest single landowners in late 15th century Iran and Transoxania. Um, and Babur, uh, he died when Babur was seven years old, but Babur links his own Oniric connection to God, his own dream connection to God, with the charisma of Khwaja Ubaidullah Ara by saying that the Khwaja would appear to him in his dreams. In many ways, when Babur uh, made his expansion from Kabul into India in the uh, 1520s, it really reinforced his Muslim identity. He composed a quatrain following the Battle of Kanwa in 1527. Um, and he said, for the sake of Islam, I became a wanderer. I battled infidels and Hindus. I determined to become a martyr. Thank God I became a holy warrior. And when he visited Gwalia later that year, he, um, his forces engaged in iconoclastic destruction of the monumental Jain sculptures there and in the Hindu temples within the fort. But Babur also cultivated associations with Indian ascetics, um, both um, Hindu and Muslim, even prior to that expansion to India. And in 1518, he very famously 
um, visited the Hindu temple at Gorkhatri near Peshawar, where there was a very large community of Nat yogis. Akbar also visited in 1581, and so the paintings that were made for various Babur Nama manuscripts probably reflect those experiences of how the community looked in the 1580s, more than maybe when Babur himself visited. But here you see Babur arriving and being greeted by the yogis at this important uh, community site here. And for Akbar, choosing to have this episode illustrated in the Babur Nama was surely a way for him to underscore the idea of Babur's broad-mindedness. The Naqshbandi were very strict in their Sunni adherence, and Humayun sought a more liberal, open form of is Islam. And he developed a close connection with um, an Indian Shatari Sufi called Sheikh Fool. And he was a renowned mystic and uh, astrologist. He was actually the brother of Muhammad Goth Gwaliali, but he was unpopular and uh, he was in fact then murdered. But from early in his reign, Akbar decided to cultivate connections with the Shishti Sufis as they offered a much more distinctly Indian Sufi identity for the emperor. The founder of the Chishtaya order was Abu Ishaq of Syria, and he then settled in a village now in modern day Afghanistan called Shishti Sharif. But it was Muinuddin Shishti who brought the order to um, South Asia. He had been born in Herat, but came to India in the early 13th century. And thus, his own journey kind of foreshadows the cultural journey the Mughals themselves would um, have in their relocation to India. And the Chishti had become the dominant expression of Sufism in northern India from the late 12th century and gave rise to favorite, favored saints like Nizamuddin Awulia and Amir Khusro of uh, Delhi. And Babur had paid homage at both of their shrines when he had first arrived in Delhi. But Akbar had more geopolitical motives, really, in making his connection with the Chishtaya. The shrine um, uh, was of Muinuddin Shishti, was at Ajmer, and Akbar considered this a bridgehead for controlling Rajasthan. It was one of four locations where Akbar undertook major con fort constructions to ensure the defense of his empire, the others being Lahore in the north, Agra, and then also at Lahabad. And uh, here we see two pages from the Akbar Nama that celebrate Akbar's connect uh, connection with the Shishti. He credited um, Salim Shishti, the current kind of uh, Shishti sheikh, with the birth of his son, um, Prince Salim. It was quite a long awaited birth of a firstborn son. And Akbar's association with the Chishti was crucial in the early decades of his reign, but it does seem to have been motivated by political ex expedience because after 1584, when Akbar left um, Fatipa Sikri, he never once returned to the Shrishti shine again, and he didn't foster his ties with the sect after that time. And I must say, I'm very per persuaded by Farooqi's argument that it was the death of um, Akbar's half-brother, Mirza Muhammad Hakim, who had ruled in Kabul, that was the turning point. Because with Hakim in Kabul, with all of his associations with the Naqshbandi in Central Asia, this was a real threat as a, a viable kind of timorid uh, alternative to the throne um, opposing Akbar. And therefore, while that threat remained, he had to maintain his own very, very strong sense of uh, identity with these close ties to the Chishtis. But uh, around the time that Mirza Muhammad Hakim uh, dies, and uh, in the early 1580s, Akbar, in any case, is detaching himself from institutional religion a lot. And he begins openly worshipping the sun, prostrating himself before fire, abstaining from meat, alcohol, and sex for certain periods of time. And this uh, unusual portrait, there are several versions of this portrait of Akbar worshipping the sun. This is the version in, in Singapore. 
um, show that Akbar was very much uh, conceiving of himself as the chief ascetic. He was the renewer of an Islamic age for the second millennium that would cross boundaries between all religions. And when we look at Akbar, he was clearly a deeply spiritual uh, person, but very few paintings from his reign actually visualize his personal encounters with holy men. And where they are visualized, they, he tends to kind of preside over them rather than them being transformative to him. So take, for example, the painting on the right where he's seated in the uh, Ibada Khana presiding over these discussions with two Jesuits um, and then other Hindus and Muslim um, uh, sort of clerics, as it were. And you can see how much Akbar's in control there. And likewise, in this very famous double opening of a fight between two rival um, uh, suborders of um, Dasanami sannyasis, uh, Basawan Patrick portrays this incredible melee of uh, figures fighting. But here's Akbar in a perfect oasis of calm and space, um, untouched by it. Incidentally, this painting, this double opening, took 68 days to complete, which is the longest of any Akbanama pages. Jahangir however, favoured images that portrayed his intimate spiritual encounters. And his sense of association with the Shishti ran much deeper than Akbar's because it actually began at his birth. So Akbar had sent uh, Prince Salim's mother to the home of uh, Sheikh Salim at, Fat at uh, Fatipa Sikri, at Sikri um, to give birth. It was almost like a protective talisman that she should give birth there. And then one of the Sheikh's daughters became a wet nurse for Prince Salim. So that made her a foster mother. And her natural son was Kutubuddin Koka, who was one of Jahangir's very closest friends. And um, Jahangir's connections with the Shishti deepened even further in the 1610s when he moved his court from uh, to Ajmer for two years, supporting the military campaigns of his son, Prince Karim Shah Jahan, against um, the Rana of Mewa and also his campaigns in the Deccan. And while Jahangir was in Ajmer, he fell very ill in 1614. He took many weeks to overcome his illness. And uh, when he got better, he felt that he owed his life twice over to the Chishti saint, Muinuddin Chishti, once through his birth and now through his recovery. And it was at this point that he then pierced his e e ears and made himself a, like a bonded slave of um, Muinuddin Chishti by wearing pearl earrings thereafter. But it was during this period in Ajmer that artists began to use allegorical symbolism uh, in a much more systematic way in Mughal um, portraiture. And this is such a striking encounter between um, Muinuddin Shishti and Jahangir. Muinuddin Shishti is the 13th century founder of the order, and he's portrayed in this full length dazzling white and he holds a large orb with the timurid crown and a key and he's kind of handing it across the page on the other side of the album opening to Jahangir sort of standing in the present tense in the present day who has an orb and he's slotted this key into um, the work and we can see that Jahangir wears a, a jama of incredible translucence. Uh, the muslin is so thin that we see his torso very clearly through it. And it's somehow as if that fabric embodies the materiality and immateriality of the two worlds that Jahangir conquers. He, he conquers the world of seen reality and the world, the world of unseen reality, of, of heavenly reality. And that's what these inscriptions refer to. The dark backgrounds accentuate that plasticity, the modeling of Bichitra's figures. And they also create a shared timeless space for their meeting across the centuries. And so I love how in this encounter, Bichitra sets up a brilliant creative tension between 
the corporeality of his portraits and the kind of ontology of their abstract encounter. These same paintings not only collapse time between each other, but they reach across the centuries to the present day as a quintessential statement of Mughal dynastic and sacred legitimacy. While Jahangir always remained a Muslim, he also took a close personal interest in Hindu beliefs. And we've seen that already in his choice to translate, uh, to, to have an illustrated copy of uh, uh, Muhammad Goth's Bar al Hayat with the yoga asanas in it. And this is another famous painting, which, because we're short on time and because you had a session on it a couple of weeks ago, I'm actually going to just uh, skip over. But here we see Jahangir meeting uh, Gosain Yadrup, uh, a very uh, admired Vaishnavite sannyasi who lived as a hermit. And again, we see how he uses this little void space, as I was speaking about in the painting of Sheikh Full by Bishandas. At the very heart of this painting is a little void space that um, symbolizes, if you like, that absorption into God. And Jahangir said of Yadrup uh, that he has studied well the science of Vedanta, which is the science of Sufism. Shah Jahan maintained that connection uh, with the Chishti and gave lavish endowments. Um, and here we see Shah Jahan arriving at Ajmer. Uh, but what I find fascinating about this painting is he's not greeted by Muinuddin Chishti. He is greeted here uh, by the mythical figure of Kisra. And Kwaza Khidra embodies the righteous servant of Islam, the giver of secret wisdom and a possessor of the waters of life. And it seems that Shah Jahan preferred this slightly more orthodox figure of Khizra compared to the Sufi saints that Jahangir uh, favored. He comes in a number of places within the Padshanama in those kind of allegorical spaces beneath the throne. But I love this fascinating work, which you can see originally was a small work that's been extended in order to add it into the St. Petersburg um, album that shows Shah Jahan and his encounter with Khwaja Kizra sort of out in the ocean, uh, Shah Jahan standing on this white stallion, almost as if he's like Neptune and he's got this lance that he is, is holding and he's receiving the waters of life from Khwaja Kizra here. And so it conveys, again, this same message, but in a different way of Shah Jahan as the Lord of Surat, of outward appearance and of Mani, of inner meaning. By the 1630s, Shah Jahan's eldest son, Dara Shikha, avidly pursued relationships with ascetics. And these encounters are reflected in many Mughal paintings where he's gathered with uh, mystics. But I love this uh, painting. Uh, Dara Shikha was born in 1615. And uh, in his very formative years as a child, uh, Jahangir's artists were being extremely experimental in the way they were drawing from multiple religions to create a visual identity for the emperor. And uh, this was a work, this work here um, shows Darashika as a teenager, bare chested, just in a cotton lungi, apart from those rich jewels that he wears. And Dara Shikha and his elder sister by a year, Jahanara, were Jah Shah Jahan's favorite children. But they were very liberal and experimental in matters of faith, more so than their father, though he was clearly liberal enough to allow that to be the case. And both Dara and Shikha and Jahanara were disciples of Myanmar, who was a very celebrated uh, Sufi of the Kadiri order who lived in uh, Lahore. On the right is a beautiful portrait of Myanmar in uh, the Lucknow State Museum. He was a real celebrity in the Punjab and was asked to lay the foundation stone of the Golden Temple, um, the Sikhs Golden Temple at Amritsar. After Myanmar's death in 1635, uh, Darashika became a disciple of his disciple, uh, um, Mullah Shah Badakshahi, 
and um, he resided in Kashmir. And what's interesting about this portrait here is that we can see that it relates directly to a Mughal portrait that ended up in the early 17th century in Vienna, in the Millionen Zimmer in Schönbrunn Palace. And also that this then was later copied by Rembrandt in his famous copies that he made of um, some Mughal drawings that had arrived in Europe. For Dara Shikha, the concept of beholding, ruyat, was fundamental to his mystic devotion. And he defined five kinds of beholding. Um, and he said that the internal and external eyes become one unified whole, whole. And this is not confined either to this or the next world and is possible everywhere and at every period. And in many ways, with such a con strong concept of beholding, it was fitting that Dara Shikha would be a, a major patron of the arts during the 17th century, since after all, art depends on looking. He really imbibed the Neoplatonism of his great grandfather, Akbar, uh, who articulated the idea that outward appearance could lead to inner truth. And this is a fascinating uh, painting made under uh, Darashika's patronage, I think, by Payag, that shows a night gathering of mystics. And um, you can see the setting by this uh, uh, large rocky outcrop with a pool and a waterfall. And if anyone wants to offer some more suggestions as to exactly what this gathering relates to, I would I would love to hear those ideas. But Dara Shikha was also, I think, influenced by Nadira Banu Begum and his father, who was his uh, also his half uncle, Prince Parvez. Prince Parvez was the second son of Jahangir. And this whole branch of the family was steeped in the universal concepts of Akbar's kind of religious philosophy of the Din Ilahi, um, a kind of very universalist religion. Nadira's mother, so, um, uh, was the only daughter of Prince Murad, and that was Akbar's second son. And Akbar had placed Murad under the avant-garde tutelage of both Abul Fazl and a Jesuit priest, Father Antonio Montserrat. So the concept of beholding, I think, is captured so beautifully in this work that kind of became the poster for today's events. Prince Parvez and a sadhu dating to around 1610. The, the two figures stand facing one another, holding each other's gaze. And the inscription beneath them says uh, that it's a portrait of Sultan Parvez, but it doesn't name the Sadhu. But it's almost as if we witness a moment of darshan between them, suspended in time on the abstract and blank space um, almost of this page. There's a tree for their setting. But Prince Parvez is there in profile. But the three-quarter profile of the Sadhu adds to this psychological intensity of their interaction. The uh, sadhu is mostly in a neem kalam form, whereas uh, Prince uh, Parvez has that coloring that uh, shows he belongs to the rich and opulent world of the court. But I love how the gesture of Prince Parvez is one of such respect that establishes a reciprocity that conveys not only their shared humanity, but also uh, co shared concepts of uh, faith. Arguably, Jahanara's contribution to the pluralism of the court was just as important as that of Dara Shikha. And uh, Jahanara was the eldest daughter of Shah Jahan. She became queen consort when her mother, Mumtaz Mahal, uh, died. And she likewise was initiated into the Kadiri order of Sufis uh, under Mullah Shah at Srinagar. And I think it's her relationship with Mullah Shah that appears to be the subject of this beautiful painting ascribed to Govardhan in the Nasir al-Din album. 
it dates around 1640 and we see the princess on the terrace and I just love the kind of slightly interfering invasion of her body space by um, one of her attendants um, and it, it captures exactly what I was saying about Govardhan being this brilliant artist of mood and wit um, here. Afsan Bukhari emphasizes, uh, and I'm quoting, the pivotal role mystical Islam played in facilitating the unmarried princess's broader participation in the socio-religious milieu of Mughal India, and it enabled her heredity claims to Timurid legacy. So really, Jahanara, through her activities, writing biographies of the Chishti saints and uh, other biographies of saints, the various treatises she wrote, as an unmarried princess, these ways were a means to assert her own imperial authority through her own agency and voice. She was acutely aware of the ocular politics, the kind of look, the optics of her role within the, the court. When it comes to Aurangzeb, uh, we have very few uh, paintings that depict his encounters, but I'm really indebted to Yael Rice for sharing this image on Twitter. A very unusual example of Aurangzeb visiting the Chishti Darga at Ajmer, dating to around 1580, and this work is in Amherst, where um, Yael Rice is a professor. And uh, we know uh, from primary sources that uh, Aurangzeb visited the shrine um, on three occasions between 1679 and 1681. But this is the only image uh, that we know of that depicts Aurangzeb at a Sufi, Sufi shrine. It possibly was commissioned by one of his two sons who are depicted rather prominently um, standing with him. But Aurangzeb's more orthodox faith uh, meant that his spiritual encounters tended to be not so much with people, but with the Quran itself. And it became a visual commonplace during Aurangzeb's reign and thereafter to draw the emperor in profile, hunched over and reading his Quran. And I love the beautiful calligraphic line of his curve back here that simultaneously kind of captures his old age and also evokes earlier Persianate style, um, comparable, for example, in the portraits of Dust Musavir some 150 uh, years earlier. Even in later Jaroka portraits, Aurangzeb still often has uh, his Quran. And in the National Museum, when I visited there recently, uh, there was a beautiful, tiny gem like Quran um, known as a mushti uh, that has, um, that belonged to Aurangzeb, and also another beautiful Quran in the National Museum in Delhi with a colophon dating it to 1396. 1396. So I've given you a whistle stop tour of. Uh, at, aesthetics and their encounters with Mughal emperors. But in conclusion, I just want to return to that idea of charisma, that concept of cool. It's so essential for the exercise of Mughal rule in India. They had to broaden their base from traditional Timurid networks. And cultivating relationships with a broad range of ascetics in India was a vital part of being established, establishing not only their political rule within the country, but a kind of sacred rule. So a relationship, an ascetics relationship is in a way, we began with the idea that it's a vertical relationship. They reach across the boundary from earth to heaven and provide access to people from earth towards heaven. But I want to finish with the idea that these relationships were not only about a kind of vertical access to God and a kind of sacred endorsement, but actually that these ascetics functioned as kind of geographical nodes across the map of India, across the political and social landscape of India that enabled the Mughals to foster and strengthen their rule. So thank you for listening so patiently to me. 
Wow, incredible, incredible this was and so richly illustrated. One couldn't take their eyes off. I mean, I think I just couldn't take my eyes off the screen and how wonderfully you put this together in such a short time. I should um, inform the viewers that I gave you less than a week's time to put this together and um, how gracious of you to have accepted this invite. And um, it was actually Professor Rizavi who was supposed to speak. And um, as you know, that he got COVID and um, we had to reschedule that. Thank you so much. Lots of comments and a whole lot of um, questions, of course. But um, let's look at how many people find this very fascinating and interesting. And um, here is um, someone you probably know. And um, so friends from all over the world and all the 70 of you who are watching us right now from different portals. Um, I hope you'll be able to revisit some of these um, miniature paintings because some of these have never been seen before on the Asha Ganga Jamni talks. And um, these are very rarely found um, images, I dare say. Well, I'm glad if that's the case. I was hoping that there would be some fresh or new things that you could absolutely, look at. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Now, let's take uh, questions up. And uh, one of the first questions that actually came up is um, from Ali Heather, who is, you know, a regular uh, uh, Ganga Jamuni uh, Asha uh, Talks um, uh, audience. So he says, Madam, do we have examples from Shah Jahan's life having encounters with Hindu ascetics? I think you answered that partly. Would you like to pick it up? Could, could you just say it a tiny bit more slowly? Because because I can't see you, I find it harder to hear it. Really, oh, clearly. you can you can turn off your uh, okay, your uh, slideshow now. Yes, please. Okay. Great. Okay, now yeah, can you repeat and okay. then? I'll Yes, uh, it's on the screen as well. So, Madam, do we have examples from Shah Jahan's life having encounters with Hindu ascetics? Well, now you're you're asking me to consider whether I can think of any single example, and I can't off the top of my head. And I do not. I, I'd be really interested if anyone else can tell me of any works that I'm overlooking in this, but really I can't think of an example of Shah Jahan in a direct encounter with a Hindu ascetic. Okay. Um, please can somebody check said. in if, if, if I'm wrong. Yes, please uh, share uh, so we can invite the viewers to share if they know an information or yeah. any information. Um, on this. So Mirza Hasnain asks, in miniatures that depict Mughal emperors with ascetics, we often see emperors having a religious or philosophical discourse with those ascetics. Do we have any evidence that what questions these Mughals used to ask in these discourses? Yeah, we do actually, because sometimes in the imperial chronicles, they would record you know what was what was discussed or other primary source materials so for example um akbar in uh, some of his engagement uh with particular hindu ascetics and I, I think i'm correct in saying that this was actually in his interactions uh with gosen yadrup as well talks about the university uni unity and diversity of all being um but yeah i think I think in some instances we do get insights into the nature of the conversations that, that they were having. All right, so the next question is from Rupa Abdi. Rupa asks, Akbar during his life had built two pa palaces outside Agra to feed poor Hindus, I think it's places, um, called Dharmapur and for poor Muslims called Kherpur. Since a large number of yogis, also called yogis, visited this place, a third place called Jogipur was built for them. Please share any details that you may have on this. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. And I thank you for sharing all those details you have with me because um, I actually didn't really know about this. So you've given me something lovely to follow up on. But obviously in um, Mughal paintings, the emperors love to have paintings that show them distributing arms to the poor. And I particularly love a Jahangirnama painting, which is um, in CSMBS in Mumbai, of uh, Jahangir at Ajmer 
where he's distributing food to the poor. And the text is specific. He's very specific about the idea that he feeds 500 poor people. And I think that he's making a deliberate quotation from the Bible in that because he's already familiar with the gospel stories. And obviously, one of the most famous miracles of Jesus is the feeding of the 5,000. And mm. I think he's just, no, sorry, he says he's fed 5,000 uh, poor mm -hmm. people in, in Ajmer, not 500, sorry. And so I think, you know, that there's a lot of uh, evidence in Mughal paintings of the way in which Jahangir likes to be portrayed as a messianic king. And so here again, I think is another example of that. But thank you for naming those places to me and I'm going to follow up on that. Great. Um, if Professor Azavi or uh, Rana Appa is listening to this, you can make um, your comment on this. Okay, so Rana Appa says, what a gorgeous miniature and explanation that is tomorrow. I mean, this, I mean, some of the um, well, miniatures I much. saw for the first time, they were just outstanding. And um, we'll take up another question. And this is again by Hasnain Aziz. Do we have um, evidence of Moors having encounters with atheists? and paintings, painting a miniature of some atheist guy? Well, you know, I'm not sure how much the category of atheist really kind of uh, existed at that stage. You know, I think we've become a lot more atheist in the in the years since the Mughals. Um, I, there are certainly, um, aesthetics that mm. the Mughals really fall out with, um, you know, uh, but I do not know of anything that's specifically to do with atheists. I think there has a kind of element of anachronism within the question. Mm. It's interesting. Uh, it's a kind of question one needs to dwell on a little more. Perhaps some food for thought for your book. Um, okay, so we have lots of praise. Okay, I'm going to take up this question by Nana Ganguly. It's a little long, but it's lovely. Though Babur disliked and ordered the destruction of huge Jain figures, but do you think in Gwalior, the Hindu architecture prefigured the style of uh, Akbar's Fatehpur Sikri with its heavily ornamented uh, beams and brackets of red sandstone? Even Shah Jahan's use of the exquisite tile work on the outer facades of Lahore Fort and gilded cupolas of Agra. Oh yes, for sure. I mean, the the although Babur did deface those uh, faces of the Jain sculptures as you make your way up into Gwalia, and um, he he undoubtedly was totally captivated by Gwalia and particularly by the Man Mandir, as you've referred to, and the, the tile decoration on the front of the Man Mandir is yes. definitely something that he, he calls it the pearl of the fortresses of India, Babu. And um, yeah, for sure that that had a, a real uh, influence um, on him. And certainly at Fatapa Sikri, you know, Akbar is very deliberately taking on board um, architectural practices from um, Hindu temple architecture and, and trying to create a fusion of styles uh, within Fatipa Sikri. And that's fundamental to Akbar's whole cultural policy. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very visual cultural policy of bringing together, um, you know, Hindu Indic traditions with the mm -hmm. Persianate as well. Uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm not, I'm really missing Professor Rizavi. I know he would have had so much to say about this. These are his two favorite topics. Uh, what is the entry of Babur on, um, on, uh, in Babur Nama on this? Is there an entry on this? Um, about Gwalia, when he goes to Gwalia? Yeah. Yeah, there is a painting in, um, certainly in the uh, first Babur Nama. I mean, most of the Babur Namas illustrate most of the same text points actually but yeah there's a lovely page of um uh babo as he enters into the Uvai valley you know that side of entering um and and you can see the monumental jane sculptures there in the in the painting yeah and then the, the kind of you know little motif of the fortress on top 
And where is this painting, if you can recall that? Uh, that one that I think I'm quoting from is in the British Library, British Library OR 3714. But then there are also Babo Nama manuscripts in the National Museum in Delhi, um, mm. in the Walters uh, Art Museum, uh, the v &A Museum have Babo Nama manuscripts. So yeah. So when I showed you the pages of Babo going to Gokhatri near Peshawar, uh, those were two Babo Nama manuscripts made in the 1590s. Great. So Nana Gangli's second question. Uh, Babur came from a strong center of Naqshbandis, but his allegiance to Shah and adopting the Shia costumes were simply a strategy to win Samarkand and with Persian support or a change of heart. Ultimately, his strategy did not work and he had to flee Samarkand. Curious. Yeah. I mean... Uh, Babo, he's he's such a fascinating uh, character, really, because, you know, age, is it 12 or 14 or something? He at age 12, I think he he inherits from his father who, who, you know, falls from his palace. And he just desires right from the get go. He has this idea that he is a great man, I think. But he wants to um, be, you know, the greatest of the Timurid princes. And Samarkand is the kind of, you know, um, place you have to conquer. That's where you have to be. Um, and so he tries and he tries. And it takes him really several goes of Nim. And like, you know, he nearly loses his life many times and everything. And eventually he gives up on the goal of Samarkand. Um, and uh, yeah, there are several points in Mughal history where they show have to show deference to Shia rulership. One of the most famous, of course, is when Humayun, having fled India, goes to the court of Shah Tamasp and has to adopt Shia customs. And there's been a lot of scholarship really in thinking about, you know, for example, Humayun has his very distinctive turban, the Tajizat, the turban of honor. And that maybe one of the reasons that kind of drives and motivates that is to be a kind of counteracting of the uh, sort of humbling, if you like, of having to take off his turban to Shah Tamasp. And so now it's kind of like a replacing of a turban of honor. Um, so, so yeah, certainly there are, yeah, your question's a great question. But the Mughals have this real obsession with, you know, Samarkand and their ancestral heartland. So really, even into the mid 17th century, you know, Shah Jahan has his kind of pretty crazy campaign to Balkh and Badakhshan that is a huge drain on the Mughal imperial forces and, and everything, and is totally unsuccessful. Um, so it drives their foreign policy over centuries, really. Oh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Okay, so there are other questions as well, and I'm going to take up a question by Sujit Das. Thank you for this brilliant lecture. Do you think that these commission images of Hindu ascetics could be a viewed uh, could be viewed as a political trope to project the image of Akbar and Jahangir as a just ruler? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I think uh, this is a really good question. Thank you. And thank you for your kind words. Um, I, it, you know, that in these images, what there's a kind of reci reciprocity happening between the uh, ruler and the ascetics that are being depicted. And certainly it is about this idea of, um, the universal manifestation so that they're an emperor who is able to encompass 
every expression of faith. This is part of how you are a universal ruler of both the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, is to show yourself in the company, as it were, able to include within your rule every kind of um, ascetic. And certainly, you know, Jahangir in his very famous allegorical portraits, they're so clever at using kind of multivalent symbolism so that uh, it expresses, you know, you know, the foundations of the universe, for example, in a very kind of, you know, Muslim way that is like the earth raised up on the fish bull, but then mm. in a way that looks very similar visually, it suddenly becomes the earth raised up on the fish with Manu. And so now the fish is like uh, Vishnu, you know, as Matsya. So visually it kind of has this incredible resonance and yet it draws from a completely different kind of source. So, yeah. Interesting. Um, also says Abhishek Sharma, interesting. Well, um, Rebecca Fox is definitely um, in love with the princess reading with the mullah. Well, I am. And, uh, I'm more in love with the lady who leans over. She's just so brilliant because she just can't help herself. And she's just like, you know, you would, you'd want to be saying to her, where are your etiquette lessons, you know? <laughs> All right. And Rana Appa is like, well, yet Aurangzeb chose to be buried in a Sufi Dargah. Yeah. And, um, and while he reads um, the Quran, his weapons are next to Aurangzeb. So um, those, is, uh, those are some of her observations. And of course, she says, it was one of the best lectures I have heard. Oh, Congratulations. So sweet of you. Thank you. I was very All nervous. Right, so speaking to all of you actually so it's nice, very kind of you. it was lovely okay so um i think there are many many people who've asked questions and lots of compliments and um of course um there's professor rizavi also oh. watching us uh as he's okay. recovering hope you're doing well so yeah. and um okay so since professor rizavi asks this question uh I am going to project this. He's, it's not a question, it's a comment. I have found an image which possibly is the image you were talking about. So he says Barber, in fact, praised the Gwalior architecture and admired yeah. it. Let yes, me just project oh, this. You. Is this the image you were talking about? I think this is the image that I was talking about. Yeah, but I'm just... I probably need my reading glasses to see it because it's all gone really small here. But if it's the one where... There is one, maybe there's another painting from a different Babu Nama where you definitely okay. see the little Jane figures as well. Yeah, here you can just see the entire, and of course you can see the entire profile of I the, think that's right, yeah. Uh, yes, I found this on the internet, but maybe a little more research would help. Hmm. Um, we have to do something on Babu Nama, and, and this was uh, Professor Rezavi's favorite thing. Um, okay, so... Uh -huh. Question by Fayaz Ali. Thank you for this. Could you please elaborate the last bit about charisma, charisma, and how would you describe this? Yeah, I mean, I think charisma is that uh, you know it, the the etymology of the word charisma is like you know um, from Greek from like grace, the gift, right? And so the idea of charisma is that kind of almost unique, untouchable thing that makes somebody an inspirational leader that kind of somehow gives them that connection to the divine or that kind of ability to draw people in. You know, we speak about charismatic people like that. And so for the Mughals, there's kind of charisma that's a concept connected into your heritage, you know, through your lineage that, you know, and, and and in fact, you know, maybe you see it in, in you know, when you get a great kind of political dynasty of a family or something, you know, where that idea of charisma is passed from one generation to the next, uh, maybe in the Kennedy family or something like that, you know. Um, but, uh, 
they also it's really important that idea of charisma also comes from that kind of like active encounter with the person and so i think you know when jahangir goes and hides away for example in for three or four hours of conversation with uh gosin yadrup and nobody knows what's taken place between the two of them there's something kind of mystical about that and it adds to that idea of like somebody who has a connection to the divine. And so much of the, you know, um, Mughal, Mughal painting, especially in Jahangir's time, is about kind of realizing on the page the kind of almost, um, it's, it's almost like a visualizing the kind of prophetic reality of who this emperor is, you know? So I hope that gives you a little bit more on charisma. Okay, so um, Dr. Lakshmi Kant Mishra says it's a wonderful lecture. His question is, how would you account for Kadam Rasul structures? Oh dear, I knew somebody was going to ask me something that I wouldn't really know what that means. Sorry, you'll have to explain to me what that is. Okay, oh, sorry, my uh, terrible we have, ignorance. Uh, no, no, we, we, there's always room for more research. So we have uh, the answer to Rupa Abdi's question by Professor Rizavi. And um, Shekhupura, Jogipura, Dharmapura, and Chaitanpura were localities meant for theologians, yogis, mendicants, and prostitutes outside city limits. They were ideally to be kept out of town at Sikri. So um, I hope uh, there is more for this, uh, more you. of this. Perhaps Professor Rizavi can take it up. Um, in another lecture the series should never end okay so there is a there is a question in hindi and this is completely out of the purview of the current lecture um but uh, it's a question nevertheless sora mishra is asking i would like to know uh, in indian culture or indian history um on the basis of identity and on the basis of um, you know their power and prestige um who is which personality uh, sort of represents India or which uh, personality, whether it's Akbar or um, Ashok or Gandhi, who do you think actually embodies the Indian culture and civilization? Thank uh, you. I just think you, India is such an incredible country with so many layers of wonderful history. And that in a sense, um, whenever we would try to answer that question, we would limit the identity of a country because part of the beauty of our histories are that they're connected. You know, I mean, I'm talking about like history in a macro sense that, you know, even within India, within the subcontinent, you have so many connected histories, micro or macro connected. But then as we begin to think globally about history, you know, and and how connected and interwoven everybody's um every everybody's history is and you know we think of the early modern period as the first era of globalization but that's not true at all you know the amount of trade and contact that was happening across the indian ocean from the ancient world and everything so to me i think i've always loved that saying which many people quote which is everything you say about india is true and so is the exact opposite and I think the same applies when you would try to, uh, you know, because of all those figures you've you've mentioned, there are they're they're so different, aren't they? Um, so and completely different periods. I don't think I can give an answer. Mm -hmm. Well quoted, Doctor Weeks. Well quoted. <laughs> well done. Um, Sorry, Misha. You this question is politician se se zata <laughs> Aur, uh, uh, baral, iska jawab, um, Dr. Weeks has given you. All of you are very good in your place. And you are from different centuries. Se so thank you so much for this excellent lecture and uh, remarkable, indeed, remarkable, beautiful works of art. Um, okay, Salim Khan. Did Babur and Humayun visualize Mughal as a Mughals as a dynasty uh, ruling in India, or it was Akbar who carved out this ideology of Mughal dynasty? Yeah, well, I think actually, you know, Humayun um, laid the foundations for a lot of the kind of visual policies that um, Akbar 
uh, brought up. So, you know, the visually there wasn't, for example, a really established school of Mughal painting under Babur, and then only began under Humayun, and mostly in his period in Kabul. And then he just returned to Delhi, and you know he died six months later, and so the things got picked up by Akbar from that point on. But actually, you know, um, there's been a lot of uh, I think conversation among historians in more recent literature about how in some ways Humayun should be seen. He gets a hard deal, right? Everyone thinks he was weak. He got ousted from India. And, you know, but actually as he, even in the period when he's in Dinpana in Delhi and things like the carpet of mirth where he's seating people, not according to their rank, but according to a cosmological order, um, or even in the turban um, that mm. uh, I was mentioning earlier, you begin to see how he was really cleverly beginning to think of visual and ceremonial ways of creating identity located in a relationship to the emperor himself as a centralized figure, rather mm. than reinforcing lots of uh, different kind of ethnicities or remaining in a very passionate way. Like even mm. his his you know, um, his distancing himself from the Nakshabandi too. And so he just didn't have time to really work that policy through. Mm -hmm. um, so so I think it's not just Agba who carved it out. I think a lot of the foundations were actually laid by Humayun. Great. So, um, oh yes, Sujit, I think I completely agree with you. When we got to see these rare images, it's opened up possibility for many other scholars. Sadly, all these images are scattered all over the world and they're not in public domain. So we'll have to travel as far as Berlin and, you know, to parts of um, the UK. To get what I would access. say is I think it's been amazing how much stuff has come onto the internet. And, you know, mm. I, I don't think... I don't think any of those images are, um, well, some of them are taken by myself in, in places, but many of them are, you know, just found on, on the internet in different ways as well. So I think the digitization, for example, of the collections, it, you know, all over the world now opens up amazing opportunities for us all. Even I can't travel everywhere. I don't have, you know, there are some scholars who can just travel wherever they want to and, you know, afford endless global travel. But sadly, I'm not in that category either. Anytime I want to come to India, I have to find somebody who wants to give me a research grant or something. Well, those things happen. And, um, okay, well, I'm going to take up this question by Salim Khan. Um, what's the belief or concept of Alan Khoa in the Mughal family? Um, I think uh, Dr. Mary Inchida Razvi also took this up. I found this term many a times in the first volume, first chapter from the Akbar Nama. So yeah, so Alankwa is the mother of Genghis Khan and the idea is that um, a shaft of light was how she was impregnated. Um, so it's kind of like a, almost like a kind of, you know, mystical birth narrative. And those narratives are really important if you want to kind of, establish the charisma, right? Because the idea that this shaft of light direct from heaven is how Genghis Khan comes into being, means that anybody who follows in his line, um, you know, is is invested with that light as well. And so as a mother figure, Alankwa, along with then the Virgin Mary in Mughal culture, become a really uh, good way of articulating ideas about female rulership um, in a culture where you're not portraying women directly. Hmm. Okay, um, we have an answer, um, Dr. Lakshmi Kantripati. Oh, thank you. We have an answer, Kadm Rasul are structures which houses the imprints of the Prophet's foot, okay. prints, and um, the, the ones um, Ranam Appa has seen are in Delhi, Lucknow, and Gore. There are many all over India, at least considered and considered Dargaz. So, um, yes, it's it's there in Jama Masjid. And um, yeah. who was it in Katma Sharif? In, um, yeah. So uh, these structures are built. So Lakshmi Panji says, these structures are built during Jahangir's time onwards visited by Hindus and Muslims and they're also found in Orissa which is where he's from 
Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. I knew there would be something that would show some egregious hole in my knowledge and you found it. Well, it's always nice because that's what learning is const constantly is about. Yeah. Okay, so everyone thanks you and um, I thank you as well. And I want to extend this absolute gratitude, uh, particularly because you agreed to doing this very last minute. And, um, you know, I, I know that Professor Rezavi and um, um, uh, Professor Rezavi and I are in absolute unison when we say we are very thankful and this was an absolute treat for all of us visually and orally as well i mean how wonderful yeah. it is thank to you so much for the lovely opportunity i i'm really grateful it was so kind of you to invite me and uh, yeah we pray on for india in this really difficult time and we yeah um mm. yeah just just yeah thank you so much it's lovely to be with you Yes, and we hope that each one of you is following the protocol and um, not stepping out and, you know, respecting the lockdown rules. And, um, yeah, we have to do this together. I want yeah. to announce... The, May I just uh, say one other thing? It's just been please, lovely yes. to make so many connections on Instagram because I just started on Instagram a few months ago. And thank you. Some of the names of questions and everything are familiar here. And if you want to follow me, my handles are just Ursula Weeks. And, uh, yeah, it's it's been... Uh, and I don't know what I was waiting for to get on, <laughs> you know, to some social media. But I've really enjoyed the very constructive academic community and much more than academic community just a wide community there so thank you all right and um next weekend on friday for sources of medieval indian history we have um Hitendra patel who will be talking about Akbar and rana pratap perceptions from colonial period to modern times this is going to be at eight o'clock on the 14th of may and um on um, Sunday, which is the 16th of May, we have Dr. Radhika Chadda and she will be talking about Portuguese sources. Um, this is Sunday, 8 o'clock again, right here. So, um, and we hope that uh, by the next, next weekend, which is the 21st and the 23rd of May, we will have Professor Rizavi with us and he will be talking to us about Ibadat Khana an institution for disputation under Akbar and Jahangir. And of course, we have Dr. Nandini Chatterjee, who will be talking to us about Mughal household archives as a sources for history, as source for Mughal history. So um, that's it from our end tonight. Hope you have a good sleep and um, hope everyone is staying safe and uh, we can hear wonderful music in the background <laughs> um, I can you actually hear the music it's lovely brilliant it's rehearsing i'm i'm sitting in the ch uh, church office and uh, oh. they're rehearsing ready for the evening meeting so great so it's a great sunday evening so enjoy this and uh, thank you so much dr weeks for joining us it was pleasure. So pleasure. thank right. you bye bye good night everyone <laughs>